Well, I cannot remember how long it's been since I heard that old song in a church service. What about you? Amen. I grew up on that song. I, I cannot remember a time when I could not sing that old song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Thank you all for doing that. I think you three guys ought to buy some chartreuse jackets, <laughs> get you some ties that match, and go on the road <laughs> with, that, uh, with that kind of singing. Well, it's good to see you tonight. Y'all had a good day? You all are being so kind and gracious and hospitable to Eric and me. We are enjoying our visit. I told a friend of mine today that I am at a, the, the prettiest place on earth. Now, this church and these grounds are just a... Uh, a picture postcard. Uh, you all are uh, a highly favored class of people to get to live out here in this place. Thank you for letting us come. I am preaching tonight from the New Testament book of First Peter, chapter one. First Peter, chapter one, beginning at verse one. And I shall preach tonight on the doctrine of regeneration. Have you found the passage? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, now notice this next statement. This is our doctrine. This is regeneration, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. I have now been a preacher a participant and an observer in Baptist life for 50 years. It is my opinion that we are in the midst of a famine. It is not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing of the gospel. I fear that we have adopted what I call the Madoff Ponzi scheme of church growth. By that I mean we have reverted to a methodology that allows us to bring in enough new people through the front doors to make up for all of those whom we lose out the back door. All the while, K 
keeping this scheme going, hoping that no one finds out. But the truth is we have been found out. Today, Southern Baptist number over 16 million members. But on the Lord's Day morning, less than half of these will even bother to attend worship at the house of God. Today, four million Southern Baptists cannot be found. They tell us that 80% of our converts occur by age 18. Consequently, we invest much of our time energy, and resources trying to reach this particular demographic. However, they tell us that when these converts reach age 18 and leave home for either college or career, we promptly then lose 80% of those from any active participation in church life. The one area where Southern Baptists have had an increase in baptisms is among four, five, and six-year-olds. And yet we often criticize the Presbyterians for baptizing infants when Baptists are not but four years away from that. In my opinion, no amount of emphasis on discipleship training is going to resolve this spiritual dilemma among us. We probably just ought to repent. We ought to repent for dumbing down the gospel. We ought to repent for preaching a gospel that does not offend the sinner. For preaching decisional salvation. That is, if we can get a person to stand still while we read three or four short, terse statements from a pamphlet and get them to repeat a prayer after us, we will pronounce them saved and we'll baptize them into the church. We probably ought to repent for being enamored with power and wealth and fame and celebrity. We ought to quit longing to have a famous person to represent Christianity. Where did we ever get the notion that if we could just get Miss Tennessee to be a Baptist, we'd get her on the conference circuit and we would add much relevance to the gospel message. Where'd we ever get the notion that if the preacher would just take his jacket off, remove his tie, get him a Hawaiian shirt with an open collar, and spike his hair, and sit on a bar stool, and dialogue, that we could enhance the appeal of the gospel. 
Where did we ever get that notion? What did Baptists have on their minds when they started taking surveys in the community to see what the unregenerate desired in a church? Are, are you all getting the gist of what I'm trying to say? I tell you, beloved, I believe we ought to return to preaching the old-time doctrines, foundational truths. So tonight I want to preach to you on regeneration. Are you interested? Amen. I ought to have three items. I probably ought to caution you at first by telling you I have five sermons on these five verses and don't you cross me or I'll preach all five of them. <laughs> Any preacher worth his salt would be tempted to preach a sermon from verse 2 on Trinitarian salvation. You've been elected or selected by God the Father. You've been saved by God the Son. And you've been sanctified by God the Spirit. Wouldn't that make a pretty good sermon? But I am going to keep our focus on this one idea about regeneration. Now here are my three points. One I want to give you the doctrinal concept for regeneration. Secondly, I want to give you the defining cause of regeneration. And thirdly, I want to give you some delightful consequences of being born again. Now under our first heading, the doctrinal concept, I want to do three things. First, I want to tell you what that means. Are you interested to know what regeneration means? I'm going to quote for you now the article from the Baptist Faith and Message. This is the official confessional document of Southern Baptist. Here's what the article on regeneration says. Regeneration is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin, to which the sinner responds with repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, Regeneration is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Ghost, a mighty grace, which the sinner does not wish to resist, enters into the man, makes a new creature of him, and he is saved. Regeneration takes into account that man is radically depraved and must be radically changed. It takes into account that men are dead spiritually, defiled morally, dominated satanically, debilitated volitionally, and damned eternally. They can't work their way or worship their way or will their way to God. They are dependent upon the interposition of the grace of God or they'll die in their sins and go to hell. And so, God taking this into consideration comes in mighty dynamic power, the same power that raised our Lord Jesus up from the dead and he quickens. 
He makes alive men who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's what regeneration is. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been changed from the creature that once I was and redeemed is now my name. That's what regeneration is. It's a change of heart. Number two, I want you to see the means that God uses in bringing about this change. Is your Bible still open? Now look, don't ever close your Bible unless I tell you. I want you to look down at verse 23. Here he's going to give us the means that God uses in bringing about this new birth. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Here he tells us, that the means which God uses in bringing about regeneration is the incorruptible seed called the Word which is equated with the Gospel. Now, would you agree that we ought to define the Gospel at this point? What would you say the Gospel is? Would we all agree that the gospel is good news? But wouldn't you agree that we probably ought to delineate further what this good news is? After all, there's a lot of good news. I mean, this fall, in fact, on August 30th, When the Arkansas Razorbacks go down to Auburn, Alabama and teach those boys a few things about college football, that's going to be good news. (laughs) Some time ago, uh, I was in my dear blind and Kansas, and I saw a little movement yonder in the bushes, and in a moment I saw the flicker of a tail, and then I saw the tips of the horns moving in the brush, and then the kill zone came into view, and I remembered that verse of scripture that said, he was a stranger and I took him in. (laughs) I sent him on to his reward. 10 point, 19 inches wide inside, weighed 250 pounds. That was good news. I got on my iPhone, started texting, started sending the word out. I had some good news. Now, when your team wins a big game, that's good news, isn't it? But that's not the gospel. A killing a trophy buck may be good news for a deer hunter, but that's not the gospel. We must go a step further in defining the gospel. The good news of the gospel is this. Even though you were wicked and iniquitous and a sinner and a lawbreaker 
and unrighteous and contemptuous. Even though the poison of asp was under your lips and you were not good and you had not sought the Lord. God, in wonderful, bountiful grace, delivered up His own Son, spared not His own Son, but set him forth publicly on the stage of time and space and drew attention, speaking audibly from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God sent his Son a a substitute for sinners. Christ took the blame and bore the wrath and his sufferings and his bleeding and his death and his incarceration in the tomb. God accepted these things as payment to holy justice. And now God can be just. And at the same time, he can justify, clear of guilt, and declare to be innocent. Every sinner, every guilty, hell-bound sinner who have come to Him through Jesus. That's good news. I tell you, when a soul is under a heavy indictment from holy justice and some witness comes along bearing this good news, I tell you, that's grace. That is good news indeed to a guilty sinner. I wish I could explain this better, but it's a miracle. It's supernatural. That's why we sing songs like this. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound, In sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And can it be? that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith within, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Oh, beloved, listen. That's why we preach the gospel. When men hear the gospel, God takes this incorruptible seed and births men into the kingdom. Is that not what happened in your case? Of course it was. Now, I've given you the meaning and I've given you the means that God uses the gospel. Now I want to give you some of the mistakes that are often made regarding this doctrine. I want to tell you that the hyper-Calvinists make a mistake. The hyper-Calvinists are those who take the doctrines of election and predestination beyond where the Bible takes them. They say, that if you've been predestined and elected, you can be regenerated apart from the means of the gospel. Consequently, they do not believe in missions and evangelism. They do not believe in a free offer of the gospel indiscriminately to all men. This is a mistake. 
We are not going to get off the horns of our responsibility to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Number two, the Church of Christ folks make a mistake here. Our Church of Christ friends say that a man hears the gospel and when he hears it, he ought to obey it. He ought to obey by repenting of his sins and believing on Christ. And we say amen to that, do we not? But our Church of Christ friends go a step further and say, post haste, immediately then, get down to the creek and get baptized because It's in your water baptism that you are spiritually united with Christ. It's called baptismal regeneration. This is a mistake. There is nothing about baptism that imparts saving grace. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward experience that has already occurred. But then there's a third mistake, and it's often made by Baptists in our day. There are some of the brethren among Baptist ranks who say, a man hears the gospel, and when he hears it, he obeys it, he repents and believes, and his repenting and his believing produces regeneration. But this is a mistake. This is getting the cart ahead of the horse. Did you ever see a horse trying to push a cart? That doesn't work. Did you ever try to push a rope? You can pull a rope and you can wad a rope, but you can't push it. And do you know what I can tell by looking at this crowd? Now, I've got the gift of discernment. I can tell by looking at this crowd that not one of you, not even one of you, would ever have repented and believed had God not quickened you and made you alive unto him. Well now, you see how quickly I'm moving through this sermon? There's the first point already. Now here's the second one. I want you to see the defining cause of regeneration. Two of them. One, monergism. I want you to look at verse three again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. Now tell me, who is it that has begotten us again? It's God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have the ESV version of the Bible, it says, He hath caused you to be born again. Did you have anything to do with your natural birth? Did you? No. No, you didn't even cooperate. And beloved, you have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. It is a single sovereign work of God. Salvations of the Lord. Jonah, at the bottom of the sea, in the belly of the fish, cried out, Salvation is of the Lord. And number two, it's mercy. Did you notice that phrase? Which according to his abundant mercy 
He has begotten us again. I like mercy, don't you? Mercy means we don't get what we deserve. Do you folks want what you deserve? I was born with my right arm only partially developed. When I was five years old, my mom and dad divorced. My mom had no job, no education, no training. She had four children. I was the youngest. I went with her to the cotton fields and followed her up and down the rows as she picked cotton to put groceries on the table. The prospects for me were just not all that great when I was five years old, except for this. Our modest frame home was situated Can I use a country expression here? Smack dab. (laughs) Smack dab in the middle of an equilateral triangle of Baptist churches. What a mercy that was. It was only about a mile over to Good Hope, only about a mile over to Fair Ridge, and only about a mile up to the First Baptist. And every time I looked up, somebody was coming by to get us to go to Sunday school or go to a revival service or a vacation Bible school. Mr. Ray Milner, Mr. Copeland Hill, Mr. James Blackledge all took an interest in our family. I have ridden in the back end of more pickup trucks going down dusty roads to the church house than you can imagine. A few years ago, I was up in southern Illinois uh, and preaching in several meetings in a row and on short notice, one of the meetings had to be canceled. And there I was with three days with nothing to do. I looked at the map and discovered it wasn't that far to skirt across the southern end of Missouri over to Kansas where I deer hunt. I called a hunting buddy of mine. I said, meet me in Bronson, Kansas, and we'll scout out some new hunting territory. And I got over there, and the only transportation I had was either in the motor home or in the back end of his pickup truck. And I ramped up into the back of the pickup truck, and they strapped my chair down and strapped me down in the chair And for seven hours, I rode all over southeastern Kansas. I went across the creeks. I went through the mud holes, through the briar patches, over boulders. At lunchtime, the two men got up in the back of the truck with me. We ate a bologna sandwich and a moon pie and drank an RC cola. I loved it. Two or three times, we had to get out on public roads to move from one farm to another. And we would have cars pass. And they would just just run off the road looking back. And I got to noticing, you could just tell what they were thinking. Did I see what I thought I saw? And then I remembered that Orkin pest control truck that had the bug up on the top of the cab. Did you ever see that? I thought that's what they think they saw. I thought it was hilarious. And I enjoyed it. You know why? It reminded me of my childhood going to church in the back end of a pickup truck. I had the wonderful mercy of growing up hearing old-time country preachers preach the old-time gospel. They told me that I was a sinner, that I was condemned. They told me that 
hell was hot and eternity was long and judgment was on its way. They told me that God had taken the initiative. He had sent His Son to die in the place of sinners, that God had accepted His sufferings as payment for sin, and that I ought to repent and believe on the Lord. I grew up hearing that over and over again. And on August 5, 1962, when I was 16 years old, though I had heard it so many times before, yet on that occasion, the Spirit of God took this incorruptible seed of the gospel and made me alive unto God. Hallelujah. What a mercy is that. Now, are you all doing okay so far? Any of you need anything? I'll send Brother Eric to get it for you. (laughs) All right, here's the third item in my lesson. I want you to see some delightful consequences of being born again. I shall mention three of them. One, you have a blessed hope in your heart. Two, you have a beautiful home in heaven. And three, you have bountiful help in the here and now. Let's look at it. Let's look at the hope. First, it is commenced at regeneration. Look at verse 3 again. We are begotten again to a lively hope. I tell you, before the Lord saved me, I had no hope. But the night He saved me, He planted a living hope in my heart. It commences at regeneration. Number two, it is confirmed by the resurrection. We are begotten again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And number three, it will be consummated at the revelation. Look down at verse five, that last statement. Ready to be revealed at the last time. Aren't you glad you have hope? And number two, you have a beautiful home in heaven. Look at verse four. You've been begotten again to to an inheritance, incorruptible, it will not spoil nor decay. And it's undefiled. There won't even be any temptation. And it fadeth not away. When we've been there, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And then he says, it's reserved in heaven. It's guarded there for you. And then he says, you have bountiful help. Look at verse five. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Now this word kept is a military term. It literally means to garrison up or fortress about. When God quickened you and saved you, He took His omnipotence and built a fortress about your soul. You know how long He's going to keep you? Until Jesus comes or called you home. I tell you, there are some delightful consequences of being born again. Now I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for prayer. In just a moment, we shall stand and sing our invitation hymn. We are on apologetic about giving an invitation, about exhorting you to call on the name of the Lord, to believe on Him. Have you had the experience that we've talked about tonight? Has there been a change in you? Are you alive 
unto God spiritually? Do you have some spiritual appetite and ambition? Do you strive to serve the Lord? Is there hope? If not, why don't you bend your knee and bow your heart and call on the Lord. Our Father, I pray now for any person in this room who's without the Savior. Lord, I pray for that person who's nearest to death, nearest to the judgment. Blessed Lord, would you have mercy upon them? Would you quicken them? For Jesus' sake, amen. Stand now and join us in singing. And as we sing, we invite your response.